So I think it's time to introduce our speaker, Chris Ashcraft. Uh, Chris Ashcraft is a creation educator employed as a high school science teacher at Cedar Park Christian Schools and adjunct, and adjunct professor at Northwest University. Formerly, Chris was a bio biology research technician specialized in plant tissue culture and genetic transformation technology. That sounds fascinating. Uh, he was employed at the Cotton Fiber Production Laboratory at Texas Tech University and the Plant Transformation Facility in Oklahoma State University. And lastly was the Plant Transformation Specialist for Eden, E-D-E-N, Bioscience in Bothell, Washington. He obtained a Bachelor's of Science in Biology from Wayland Baptist University in 1989 a Master's of Science in Biology from Texas Tech University in 1996, and a Master's Education from University of Washington in 2008, and a Master's in Teaching Math and Science from Seattle Pacific University in 2012. So let's welcome Chris Ashcraft. <laughs> well, thank you much, thank you much. I always love coming. Oh, it's just a tremendous group. I don't know if you, if you don't know how unusual this is, but this is very unusual. The, the amount of the, the attendance that you have, the, the leadership that you have that's responsible for these programs. I mean, this is just very, very atypical. And I've, I hope you're blessed by it all because, or know that you're blessed by it all because truly you are. Uh, I, uh, I don't want to plug it, but if you haven't read Milt Marsh's book, that, uh, that's a tremendous historical uh, book with the, the Emperor Has No Clothes or something. I might be butchering the title a little bit, but I read it several years ago, and I have uh, referenced that numerous times over the years to be able to get it for such a price. And have the, I mean, trem a tremendous work, I'm just saying. Tremendous work. <sighs> well, you know, science is really important for a person of faith. I, uh, I love teaching at a Christian school. I, to being able to teach science at a Christian school, I could not do otherwise. I could not ethically teach at a public school, at least uh, being that I teach life sciences. I could not ethically be forced to teach a bunch of young people the lies that are being fed to them today. I mean, terrible lies. I'm, uh, I'm actually I just put together a new presentation. May, we may get around to it next year called, uh, that's titled, uh, The False Teachings and Frauds That Convince the World of a Terrible Lie, Evolution. Because it is a terrible lie that's being taught today. They're teaching our, these young people you know, that uh, the world just formed all by itself magically and they're nothing but a bunch of evolved apes. It's a terrible lie. <clears throat> so we, science is very important for, for us as a person of faith because uh, we need to be able to, to be a witness today, we need to be able to address those lies. We need to be able to counter them with, uh, with arguments, uh, the true interpretations of scientific findings. Because remember, when they're, what in reality they're teaching are not facts. They're teaching us a speculative history of the world as though it's an absolute fact, but in reality they're just teaching us uh, interpretations of findings to support their view, which is a false worldview of naturalism, of atheism. So science is very important for a person of faith for these reasons, but also it's very, very important because we got to remember that what we're studying, when we study is science, when we're, what we're learning about is God's creation. And it's a wonder, wonderful thing that he has made for us. And by, by studying his, uh, his, his creation, you, you can develop a better appreciation of who your father is, what it is that he's provided for us. You can see the love that he showered upon us by the study of his creation. We also need to remember that, that what we're studying is the word of God. You can argue this, that there's the written word, the Bible, there, there is the living word, his son, but he's also, the creation is the spoken word of God. We're studying the word of God. Psalms uh, 33, 6 says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Proverbs uh, 3, 19, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth, by understanding he established the heavens. We're studying the Word of God. Well, the wisdom of the Word of God is evident in the complexity of the universe, which runs just like clockwork. Rather than chaos, we've discovered the, the very opposite, that what we have is a cosmos, the word meaning an ordered universe. The universe is ordered. Scientists have described this precision through what are known as scientific laws. 
Now, these laws are descriptions of observed phenomena that are often expressed in the terms of a single mathematical equation. You might remember some of these, or maybe all the way back from high school science or something. For example, Sir Isaac Newton devised an equation that calculates the strength of gravity based on the mass and distance between two objects. Or his famous second law of motion, force equals mass times acceleration, or Einstein's equals mc square, his mass energy equivalence formula, or up at the very top, you'll see the ideal gas law if you've uh, had some chemistry. Well, it was in fact the belief in a lawgiver that was the basis for the concept of the scientific law that the cosmos would be governed by unchanging constants flowed rather freely from theism rather than randomness, chaos, and disorder, as one would expect from a, a universe birthed out of a great cosmic explosion, what we see is clockwork precision governing the cosmos at every level. Sir Isaac Newton is well known for as a, being a believer of science. A great many quotes from Sir Isaac Newton profess to his belief in God. I gave you a QR code there if you wanted to snap a few more quotes from Sir Isaac Newton. In addition to being the founder of many of the scientific laws, he was the co-discoverer of calculus. Not the co-inventor, as it's often stated, because he did not, we did not invent mathematics. We simply discovered that mathematics governs the physics of the cosmos. In fact, prior to the 20th century, the majority of scientists and most of the founding fathers of the very science disciplines believed that the God of the Bible created the cosmos and were very committed to the existence of God. And for most, Christianity. People like Johannes Kepler, Robert Boyle, Copernicus, Galileo. Moreover, because they believed the cosmos was designed, they expected that it would be intelligible to the human intellect, which led to what we call the scientific revolution. The scientific revolution is due to the fact that at this period of time, so many of the world's scientists were believers in God. See, when your worldview's correct, when your interpretation of the world is correct, you're going to interpret findings correctly more often than not. As we are today in a, you know, on a day when science is dominated by the false worldview of naturalism, science in a way is stagnated, particularly in some areas like molecular genetics. They have to stumble across a, a uh, discovery, an important discovery instead of their, instead of their, their worldview leading, it, leading us there. For example, I mean, only, only a person that believes the, the universe was birthed out of a great cosmic explosion would believe that anything that exists does not have a purpose. But uh, if you believe that the world was created, that it was made by a, a living God, then in gen genetics, for example, you would never assume that there is such a thing as junk DNA, but that was a governing cosmos for a great, a governing, a governing concept for a great many decades within the geneticists, molecular geneticists, that the vast majority of the genome was junk. But now we know conclusively that there is no junk DNA. This was overturned by a research project uh, um, called ENCODE. There was a, an international research project called ENCODE that studied the, the, the areas of the genome that were believed to be junk DNA and have found purposes for all of these. Most of them were regulatory in nature. Well, in addition to the, uh, the, the, the cosmos being governed by math, mathematics, there being mathematics behind the physics of the cosmos, we have also discovered that information governs the biological world. Biological information exists in the cells of all living organisms as this complex molecule we call DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, shown here. This molecule carries complex coded instructions for the assembly and use of proteins in cells. And proteins are the machinery and the material that make life possible. Proteins do everything. They, uh, they are the in their molecular machines, they make, and for many, they are the building blocks. Your hair and your fingernail, for example, are made of pure proteins. Today, everyone acknowledges that DNA is information. This is not a contested uh, assertion. Even Bill Gates said it's by far the most sophisticated program around. DNA is information. Well, the fact that DNA is coded information causes it to stand as the single most powerful argument for intelligent design that exists. Because in all human experience, invariably, information has been found to come from only one source, and that's an intelligent mind. 
Since intelligence is the only known cause of specified information, the presence of such information in cells points definitively to a designing intelligence behind life on Earth. Uh, something that scientists should have concluded long ago because that's how science is supposed to work. You're supposed to use your past knowledge and experience to inform your observations and reach conclusions. In all past human experience, we've only found information come from an intelligent mind. When it was discovered that information was there in cells governing the very processes of life, it should have led to at least the hypothesis that, that, that uh, there was a, a mind behind life on Earth, but they just turn a blind eye to their discoveries. Well, the amount of information packed into each and every cell is truly mind-boggling, and I want to illustrate this for you. Now, humans have 46 chromosomes, these long strands of DNA we call chromosomes that are in cells. We have 46 chromosomes that range in size from 1.7 to 8.5 centimeters in length. We have 46 of them in each cell. If you take all of the DNA strands in one cell and attach them end to end, it would form a strand that's about six feet long. Well, we have about... Uh, 100, well, the 100 trillion cells in the human body total, about 40% of those are believed to be bacteria, which brings us down to about 60 trillion cells in the human body. If you take the DNA and all 60 trillion cells in the human body, it would form a strand that's, that would stretch to the moon and back, not just once or twice, but 140,000 times. A strand that is, in fact, 67 billion miles long. That's how much DNA, how much information there is in the human body. To illustrate this another way, the text on the right that you see is uh, DNA sequencing information. I, I sequenced many genes while a technician at Texas Tech helping PhD students with their dissertation work mostly. Uh, well, that's a DNA sequencing gel between the DNA molecule and the text that you see on the right. But what the DNA code is abbreviated with the letters A, T, C, and G, standing for the four main nucleotides that make up DNA, adenosine triphosphate, thymine triphosphate, et cetera. And so we abbreviate these with the letters A, T, C, and G. Well, if every, and those letters represent the individual steps or rungs along the DNA strand that kind of looks like a ladder. So the DNA strands, what you see there on your left, it's called the double helix because it's a ladder that's been twisted into this shape. Well, each step or rung along that ladder is made up of one of these four molecules we call nucleotides, which are the A, T, Cs, and Gs. And what you see there is DNA sequencing information. If you take one of your genes and determine the order of the A, T, Cs, and Gs, that's what you see right there. Well, if each of those letters is taken to be equivalent to the letters in our alphabet, then the amount of information in one human cell would fill a thousand books. Letter per letter, A, T, C, and G. If those are letters are equivalent to the letters in our alphabet, the number of nucleotides in one human cell would be equivalent to that which would be found in a thousand books. Or to put it another way, a little pile of DNA, two millimeters in size, the size of a pinhead, would fill 500 stacks of books reaching the moon or a single stack of books 93 million miles high. It's an incredible amount of information. A little clip from God of Wonders. If simple water molecules that form ice crystals exhibit magnificent structure, consider the design ingenuity behind large, complex molecules, such as DNA. DNA contains the blueprint for all life and is by far the densest information storage mechanism known in the universe. For example, the amount of information contained in a pinhead volume of DNA would fill a stack of books 500 times higher than from here to the moon. The program code and design of such an incredible system indicates a supremely intelligent designer. The evidence to me that just cries out that there's a God is the study of DNA. DNA is a very powerful, massive information storage system. In fact, DNA that makes up our genes actually is like books of information that's read by a language system. It's absolutely phenomenal. And scientists know today that language as a code 
only come from an intelligence and information only comes from information. Nobody's ever seen matter by itself give rise to a code. Nobody's ever seen matter by itself give rise to information. And as you look at DNA, it actually cries out in the beginning, God created the universe. We all begin as a single cell the size of a period at the end of a sentence. How does that cell know how to build a, a body with 100 trillion uh, cells in it, thousands of different kinds, and each one of them is so complex, nanochemical machinery beyond our comprehension how it works, and encoded is the instruction manual. It's the manufacturer's manual how to build and operate every part of this incredible body made up of 100 trillion cells. Furthermore, DNA is a three-dimensional molecule that is self-replicating. Each molecule is able to make an identical copy quickly and efficiently. The Lord has even programmed DNA to detect and correct replication errors. These sophisticated capabilities far exceed man's means. God has created the DNA molecule in such a way that it is self-correcting. There are special proteins called enzymes that go up and down the DNA molecule looking for and making repairs on a minute-by-minute, second-by-second basis. God created us with a DNA code that actually has what we call editase or editorial type enzymes. Just as an editor reads a newspaper or a book looking for mistakes, so God has created special enzymes enzymes that go up and down our DNA molecule, repairing the mistakes in ways that are unbelievably complex. There are many examples in creation of, of things that demonstrate the biblical God. Uh, one would be in our very DNA. Our DNA has information in it. And there is a whole field of scientific study called information science, which studies how information originates, how it's transmitted, and so on. And one of the laws of information science says that information never originates by itself in matter, never spontaneously comes about. Anytime we trace uh, the copying of information back to its source, it always, it always comes back to a mind. And since we have creative information in DNA, that tells me that DNA comes from intelligence. It's not something that could possibly come about through millions of years of mutations and natural selection. That just won't work. Yet even the DNA molecule is simple compared to cells. All life consists of cells, and each cell functions as a miniature city. When we consider that a human body consists of trillions of cells working together as one unit, we should be in humble awe of our Creator's intimate care and perfect wisdom. Well, despite the overwhelmingly powerful evidence for intelligent design that exists with this, with this information that's been discovered in cells, scientists today that are committed to their worldview of naturalism simply refuse to acknowledge the obvious implications of these observations. Francis Crick, shown here, is the co-discoverer of the DNA helix one of two scientists that actually worked out what the shape of the DNA helix looked like. He won the Nobel Prize for his discovery in 1962, but states this, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. See, some people don't want to believe what the evidence clearly shows. They want to believe there is no God and have to, how often, just every once, have to constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed but rather evolved. Constantly remind themselves because the evidence for intelligent design, the evidence for design in the living world is so overwhelming, you have to constantly, as a research scientist, constantly remind yourself that there is no God. Well, one reason for such a statement by Francis Crick is that today we know that the cell is vastly more complex than previously understood. Drawing an analogy to describe the complexity in the cell from our own experiences is, is, is difficult because our, nothing in human experience compares to the complexity that's been discovered there. Our marvels of modern technology pale in comparison 
to the complexity we find there. Only something as large and as complex as a city, miniaturized down to a microscopic scale, could even serve as an analogy for some aspects of the things we've discovered in cells. But in true, truly, we can draw some analogies. The cell has a cytoskeleton, uh, like the girders and the beams and things that we use to make our various things in cells. There are highways within the cells that assemble and disassemble. There's a central library of information and a system to distribute that information. There's armies of machines, uh, molecular machines, some of these we call enzymes. And there's in fact factories full of machines we call organelles, like the mitochondria and the chloroplast, et cetera, et cetera. The it, but this is far more complex than a cell because, uh, than a city because this is a, uh, a, a city, if you will, that can make a copy of itself within 20 minutes. Bacteria under optimum conditions can grow and divide about once every 20 minutes. And many cells have the ability to move. You can move from one location to another, by far more complex than even our cities. Well, the numerous molecular machines have now been discovered as that which simply could not have evolved because they are irreducibly complex. They will only function when each and every part are present and assembled together. They cannot be constructed bit by bit over multiple successive generations. For example, this little transport protein that I was showing you here, a, a protein that's uh, walking down one of the highways in the cell, transporting a package of manufactured goods. But this animation really doesn't do justice to what actually is taking place. Look closely at this video and you will see that these highways are in fact interstates where armies of these delivery vehicles are carrying manufactured goods from one side of the cell to another. They are involved in intercellular transport, delivering materials from one cell to the, the next. Armies of those little kinesis and uh, walking robots travel, traveling down one of the highways or in this case, interstates of the cell. Many molecular machines have been discovered that are irreducibly complex. Another important mach molecular machine is the ATP synthase. This is a turbine engine built from 500 separate protein subunits. 500 separate genes were necessary to construct this. It is a tiny molecular rotary motor that spins driven by the a flow of protons rather than the flow of electrons like we used to in our machines. And it spins at a rate of up to 350 revolutions per second and makes uh, the, this all-important molecule called ATP which is what powers every process in the body. We eat carbohydrates, we eat plants that make carbohydrates because those carbohydrates are used by and large by this process to make another energy carrying called ATP. That powers everything from muscular contraction to nerve impulse, transporting things from one place to another. To understand the importance of this, the average human uh, cell in the human body makes about 10 million ATPs per second. And will consume and re, you will consume and remake half your body weight in ATP every single day. It's poisons like cyanide, you probably heard of cyanide, actually will kill you in 30 seconds because they block ATP synthesis. It's extremely important, extremely complex molecular machine. A little clip from uh, CMI on the ATP set. ATP is produced by a tiny molecular rotary motor, rotating it up to 7,000 RPM. These are so small that 100,000 would fit side by side in a millimeter. A current of protons drives the motor, unlike man-made electric motors which use electrons. This portion of the enzyme is where adenosine diphosphate is combined with a phosphate ion in the presence of a catalyst to produce ATP, which is then released, making way for the next cycle. A top view of the enzyme shows the sequential operation. Almost every biochemical process in your body requires ATP. Such a nanomachine exhibits all the characteristics of super-intelligent design. ATP is vital for life, and many of these motors were needed before the first living cell could exist. An evolutionary impossibility. Another important molecular machine is the flagellum. Now, the flagellum is basically an outboard motor that many cells use to move themselves through aqueous solutions, in this case, bacteria. Now, if you look how fast these bacteria are moving, they, they can move using this flagellum at about 60 cell lengths per second. If you compare this with something like a cheetah, in the same terms, body lengths per second, the bacteria would be moving something equivalent to 164 miles an hour. 
The flagellum is a nano machine that is built using information from approximately 50 different genes, each of them in multiple copies ranging from just a few to some others, others in ten, tens of thousands. The bacteria, in fact, constructs this complex nano machine more efficiently than any human design process. It is, in a, wor in a word, the world's smallest rotary propulsion system. It has, it has constructed of proteins rather than metals or alloys like we make our machines out of, but it has many of the same parts we put in our machines. It has a rotary motor, it has bushings, a drive shaft, a rotation switch regulator, there's a universal joint, and in this case, a, a propeller made of, that's made of a helical substance. Well, discoveries of these machines and cells has shown conclusively that Darwin's predictions were horribly incorrect. In The Origin of Species, Darwin said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find out no such case. Well, like molecular machines are just that. They're irreducibly complex. It cannot be built by in a step-by-step -step manner over many different generations. Their discovery should have caused Darwinism to absolutely break down, but instead they turned a blind eye to them, refused to acknowledge what they imply, and continued to teach evolution as though it's an absolute fact. It's unconscionable. Well, what God has made is really amazing. And again, by learning about his works, we can arm ourselves with the better arguments to use against these false teachings of our day, but also develop a better appreciation of who our Heavenly Father is. And for this, we live in a very fortunate time. Recent advances in uh, technologies have allowed us, to, allowed us to see parts of God's creation never before seen. Never before seen. Powerful microscopes like the electron microscope shown here can magnify things up to 100,000 times. 100,000 times. A standard classroom microscope magnifies things to 400 power. At such magnification, we can see exquisite detail. To illustrate this, I want to first show what diatoms look like under a standard optical microscope. These are, these are diatoms, a single-cell algae that makes a cell wall for itself out of silica. And those cell walls have these beautiful geometric shapes, beautiful geometric shapes. Those of you that are gardeners that maybe use diatomaceous earth probably didn't know what, uh, what beautiful creatures diatoms really were. Well, let's look at some of these diatoms under one of these big electron microscopes. At this level of magnification, the engineering evident on just the surface of cells becomes abundantly clear. What it is that God made is amazing. But again, no one has ever seen these before. But of course, some things you might not really want to see under such magnification or know that they exist, like, uh, like dust mites. You might not want to know that when you're you know, when you're working in the garden that uh, dust mites might be crawling all over you, you know, or in, in your bed with you. You may not want to know about these things. Or maybe uh, some, and some of these things, you know, under this magnification look straight out of science fiction. Look at these things. Yep, those are real. Those are real. <laughs> I mean, the, the fish parasite in the lower right looks like something out of the movie Alien. If you remember the movie Alien with Sigoni Weaver, like one of those hits. Good grief. Sometimes you may not want to know what's out there, but incredible it still is. Well, electron microscopy has been used to discover some remarkable engineering in the biological world. Recently, scientists at the University of Cambridge discovered a remarkable design feature in this tiny little insect called a leaf hopper, published in uh, just 2013. Well, it jumps as its primary mode of movement, similar to a flea, and does so over incredible distances and speeds thought to exert somewhere between 500 and 700 G-forces during its jump. As such a power, a mechanism to critically control the timing of its legs is necessary because if one of its legs fired just a microsecond before the other, it would enter in what's called a yaw rotation during its powerful jump. Well, to accomplish this precision jump, the leaf hopper was designed with hind leg joints with curved cog-like strips of opposing teeth that intermesh and rotate just like the mechanical gears in our bikes or cars to synchronize, in this case, the legs, the animal's legs when it launches into that jump. Well, Malcolm Burroughs, the lead researcher at the University of Cambridge, remarks on the design features. He says this, quote, 
the gears in the Isis hind leg bear remarkable engineering resemblance to those on every bicycle and inside every car gearbox. Each gear tooth has a rounded corner at the point it connects to the gear strip, a feature identical to man-made gears, such as bicycle gears. Essentially, it's a shock absorbing mechanism to stop the teeth from shearing off. The gear, gear teeth on the opposing hind leg lock together like those in a car gear box, ensuring almost complete synchronicity in leg movement. But of course, this extraordinary illustration of design is in God's creation is dismissed as an evolutionary artifact. Malcolm Burrell states this, these gears are not designed, they're evolved, representing high speed and precision machinery evolved for synchronization in the animal world. In the article, he talks over and over about design and about engineering, but refuses to acknowledge what that means. Behind designs, there's a designer. Behind engineering, there's an engineer. But I, I think you also have to say these kind of things because it's the only way today you will get published, period. You go pointing out designs and engineering in the biological world, you better make it really apparent to the editors of that publication that you're not talking about real design and real engineering, you're talking about evolved structures or you're not going to get published. You're not going to get published today. Mm -mm. Well, one of the features that make our world so beautiful and pleasing is the tremendous colors that abound. See, God has made the world full of beautiful colors because he loves us. I don't know. As I get older, I, it's sad that we become so desensitized to things that are around us, you know. We become desensitized. You stop looking at the beautiful sunsets or the beautiful mountain scenery in the background. You stop looking around, but I've started rekindling my awe of the works that God has made. We can see his love. See, he didn't want to just make a world that was a habitat, but one that was pleasing to us, one that was beautiful. And colors are a big part of that. <clears throat> but perhaps, you know, uh, you could also argue that perhaps the colors were one of the ways that he revealed his divine nature to us. There's a lot of color described in, uh, in, in God's throne, in the streets. And... Well, the various colors in the creation are made by combining photons of light from the three primary colors, red, green, and blue. Pigments do this by absorbing some of the wavelengths of, of photons, but reflecting others back. So plants that look green to us are reflecting back the photons of light that are green to us and, and absorbing the others for use in photosynthesis. Well, the pigment melanin is one of these common and ubiquitous pigments in the animal kingdom, and we, we, we have them, and that's what gives us our various shades of brown is the pigment melanin. And, and this butterfly, he has pig, uh, the pigment melanin that gives him brown on the bottom side of his wing, but on the top side of his wing, he's blue. And uh, researchers come to find out that he doesn't have any blue pigment. <clears throat> Instead, the blue color is produced by what's called controlled iridescence. Now, iridescence can be seen in things like soap bubbles that reflect back various colors of light, but in the blue morpho, there's not various, various colors reflected back, but a uniform shade of blue. If you tilt them a little bit, you can see some purples coming at you in there, but it's a bright and brilliant uniform shade of blue. Well, in 2001, using uh, some high, some of these high-powered scanning electron microscopes, they, were, they discovered the mechanism behind the color produced by the blue morpho. Now, all butterflies and moths have scaled-covered wings. That's what their name means. Lepidopteran means scaled wings. These are normal butterfly wing scales uh, shown under one of these powerful electron microscopes going up to 200 power and now to 1,000 power and now just one scale at 5,000 power where you can see the long beams supported by what we call joists along their length. Well, when they, took a, did a, when they looked at the blue morpho scale, it didn't look like this. The joists weren't there, or they were, there was only a piece of a joist. It had long beams, but the joists were either would appear to be broken. So they did a cross-section of it to take a look, and what they realized was the joist was actually a reflective surface, and that there were multiple of these reflective surfaces going down the length or side of this beam. 
And these ridges, uh, these things, uh, these reflective surfaces, uh, because they're in successive layers, per, per intensified the color uh, using a, what's called a tetrahedral or diamond like structural arrangement of the scales. Those multiple reflective surfaces uh, allow the blue morpho designed to intensify the color through what's called constructive interference, wherein the light waves complement each other and strengthen the reflection. The effects of uh, this iridescence create a much more uniform color than uh, ordinary pigments ever could. And a number of people have uh, now designed technologies that are colored based on the designs of the blue morpho. Well, cephalopods, my last example of a of a color of color in the in the biological world are the cephalopods and these guys are the absolute masters of color and they, they include both your octopus and your squids and the cuttlefish seem here they can't change their color creating complex patterns that they use to communicate with each other squids are clearly uh, communicating with each other by creating these complex patterns on their side they'll be showing patterns to the squid on this side but nothing to the squid on the other side and uh, they also use them to actively camouflage themselves. Well, animals have multiple technologies available to change their color, but cephalopods have all of them. They have every single technology available in the animal kingdom available in this one organism. They have chromatophores, which is what you're seeing in this video right here. Uh, think about the chameleon, changing colors of the chameleon. That's what the chromatophores do. These are actually fish scale chromatophores that you see here. But they are cells, uh, the uh, elastic sacs inside of cells that can be stretched out, filled full of pigment. And these pigments can be stretched out to make the whole cell look like that pigment or they can be shrunk up so you can hide the pigment. But they have multiple technologies. They have iridophores. These are tiny stacks of plates that produce iridescent color like the blue morpho. They also have plates that reflect back surrounding light to help them match the surrounding light and camouflage themselves that way. And they also have bioluminescent structures. If you know what bioluminescence is, the light that many uh, animals and microbes can produce. Your jellyfish down in the deep dark are tremendously colorful, looking like, a, looking like spaceships, flashing all kinds of reds and blues, and it's incredible. But not only can the cuttlefish and other cephalopods change their color, they can also change the texture of their skin. And by doing both can match vegetation, gravel, or coral perfectly. This is the same cuttlefish on the left versus right side. Watch this octopus as he decides he wants to become a, a piece of seaweed and just settles down there and uh, boom, blend into their surroundings, something they can do almost instantly. Well, cuttlefish can, however, either use this, uh, this ability to actively camouflage themselves or to do something else pretty bizarre. And this is a cuttlefish trying to catch up to a crab and he'll change the texture of his skin making it bumpy he'll throw up its arms to try to match the surrounding coral but crabs aren't fooled because coral don't swim yeah the coral coral doesn't swim at you so when you see a big chunk of coral swimming at you you know you're not really full but if you can't fool the crab with your active camouflage you can do something else if you're a cuttlefish and that's you can put on a light show to mesmerize your prey, a form of hypnosis, if you will, to stun your prey into freezing for a moment on this weird spaceshipy light show thing hovering above you just long enough for your, for your arms to come in and grab you. Watch. Now that's the cuttlefish putting on that light show. That's not reflection from the surface. Look at that. <laughs> it rises... Remember the old um, the movie, The Jungle Book? If you remember the old Jungle Book movie, there was a, there was a snake in Jungle Book that would catch Mowgli and put him up in, the, in his coils up in the tree trunk. And then, was it Khan? I think his name was Khan. Shere Khan was a tiger, and I think Khan was the name of the snake. And he, then he would hypnotize him with his eyes. You know? I guarantee the producer of the movie, The Jungle Book, did not know that there were really animals in nature that did such a thing. Well, God spent an exceptional amount of time making animals, one full day making the flying creatures and sea creatures, and one full day making the land animals and humans. Incredible design can be seen in their study from the microscopic to the very massive. But we might want to ask ourselves, why did God make these things? Animals, by and large, are competitors for us in an ecosystem. Well, one reason is clearly stated in the book of Job that they would be a witness to us that the world was made. This is Job's response. 
But now ask the beast and let them teach you and the birds of, of the heaven and let them tell you or speak to the earth and let it teach you and let the fish of the sea declare to you who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, been understood through what has been made. He's revealed himself to us through his creation. And we can learn about God's qualities by observing what he has made. God made the world full of wonders because he is wonderful. Beautiful things because he is beautiful. He made things that are tremendously powerful to show his power. Things of tremendous complexity and Tremendous, mis tremendously mysterious things because he is beyond our understanding. He has made things of enormous power and because he is powerful to display his divine nature to us by the creation that he has made. There is powerful evidence for the existence of God. Well, we want to take a break right there and come back to the macroscopic level and look at some of the more amazing things that God has made. Well, again, I think if anyone looks at the world around them, they can see, they can see that God not, didn't just create a habitat for us, a place to live. It's not it doesn't just have the stuff that we need, the plants and the rocks and the water, but we can see his love poured out into the world that's around us. It's full of beauty, beautiful sights, whether it's the sunsets. You know, studies have shown that the color of the sky, that, that shade of blue, is the, the color that, that has the most greatest calming effect on people. You look at the sunsets, the beautiful adornments of pinks and purples and sunsets or sunrises, the, uh, the sh abundance of colors and the flowers or the birds, I, uh, even the birds' songs. I mean, right, the birds are kind of coming back right now, and all the songbirds, and I, I have my own personal favorite song, songbirds, the Swainson's thrush. I just, you know, you just look at the world that's around you, whether it's the sights or the sounds or the smells or the taste, you can see God's love poured out for us. But if a person rejects creation and accepts the lie of naturalism, who gets glory for this? Who gets thanks for this, for all of this love? It's not our Heavenly Father that gets thanks for all of the abundance of love that we enjoy and appreciate so much in this wonderful world that he's made, but who gets, who gets the thanks for this? Who gets the glory? Is Mother Nature gets the glory and honor for this? Well, ask a question about the animals. Why did God make those things? We could ask the same question about the heavens. Why did God make that vast expanse of space filled with stars and galaxies beyond number? Well, they're also to be a witness to us, just like the animals were in the book of Job. When we look up into the heavens, we see more of who our Father is. Psalms 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out on all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Psalms 56 says, the heavens proclaim his righteousness. Only parts of the creation said to declare God's glory and his righteousness. Well, through advanced technologies like our space telescopes and, and now space crafts, we've learned how much bigger the creation is than previously thought previously known and therefore by extension how big our God is so how big is the creation although enormous from our perspective the earth is small compared to the other planets shown here are the relative sizes of the planets the Sun by comparison is enormous making up 99.8 percent of the mass of the entire solar system the Sun is an enormous fireball a ball of plasma, or what we call charged gas, 
that provides the earth with the perfect amount of heat and light through thermal nuclear fusion reactions. It's fusing together hydrogen atoms to make helium and produces enormous amounts of heat, enormous energy radiation given off, such as that, and many of these reactions cause, uh, uh, these, cause these explosions we call solar flares that grow and erupt continuously, producing an enormous amount of radiation. Radiation that would be harmful to us if God had not provided our earth with the, the, the perfect protections by way of the, uh, our magnetic field in our atmosphere that protects us from this radiation. Now, these are real images of the sun taken by NASA's Solar Dynamic Observatory, which has been providing us with these amazingly clear and detailed pictures of how massive these explosions on the sun really are that grow and erupt. Well, when compared to the size of the earth, these flares help illustrate just how big the sun really is. The sun is 109 times the diameter of the earth. 109 earths could fit along the face of the sun. 1.3 million earths could fit within the sun. Well, the enormous size of the solar system is itself hard to fathom. If you reduce the size of the solar system to one billionth, of its present size. The earth on that scale would be the size of a grape and Jupiter would be about five blocks away. All of these pictures were taken from space telescopes and spacecrafts that have given us close-up views of the other planets shown here that were only previously visible to us on earth as pinpoints of light, indistinguishable from the stars except for they wandered. That's what the name planet means. They were the wanderers. All the other stars stay fixed in the sky, but there were a few that moved in relation to the others. It's true, we're truly amazing to live in these times when technology allowed us to see and investigate parts of God's creation never before seen by human eyes. Truly, God's handiwork has been revealed to us like no other time in the history of the world, and we should uh, feel, our, feel fortunate, for we truly are. Well, the sun is actually small in comparison to some stars, 640 light years away is the Orion constellation shown here, visible to us in this hemisphere, and, and, uh, and easily spotted if you it can spot Orion's belt, the three stars in the center known as Orion's belt. Well, in the upper right hand of Orion, there's an enormous doll called Betelgeuse, which has dimmed uh, dramatically in just the last uh, couple of years, I think something that's still a bit of a mystery. But Betelgeuse is 1,100 times the diameter of the sun and could hold more than 1.6 bill, 1 billion suns within its volume. Over two quadrillion Earths could fit within this star called Betelgeuse. Our sun is actually considered a, a yellow dwarf by comparison. Betelgeuse is called a red supergiant, one of the largest and most luminous stars known. But there are objects even bigger than these stars. Within the Orion constellation, we also find a nebula, an a cloud of gas and dust believed to be the remnant of a star that has gone supernova. There in the, within the Orion constellation, we find uh, the Orion Nebula. This Orion Nebula spans 13 light years. To help better understand how big this really is, a light year is the distance that light will travel in one year, traveling at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second. So if you're able to travel 186,000 miles per second, it would take you 13 years to travel from one side of the Orion constellation to the other side of that constellation. But there's constellations even bigger than that. This is the, excuse me, a nebula even bigger than that. The Eagle Nebula is even more massive than the Orion Nebula. It spans 50 by 70 light years across. There's one little portion of it that I will circle for you right there and then enlarge. This is called the Fairy of the Eagle Nebula. It alone is 10 light years tall, this little, one little portion, 8.5 million times larger than our solar system. And our God made things bigger than these. All of these stars, star clusters, nebula, are all within our own galaxy, the Milky Way. This is uh, the center of the Milky Way visible over Monument Valley, Utah. The Milky Way is believed, to be a, look like, is believed to look like this. It's a barred spiral galaxy, believed to be about 100,000 light years in diameter. 
with about 300 billion stars. Our solar system is uh, located about right there between two of those spiral arms in what's called the galactic habitable zone. For a size comparison, if the galaxy were the size of North America, the entire solar system would fit into a coffee cup. If we left the Milky Way traveling at the speed of light, it would take, again, 100,000 years before the full shape of the galaxy would become visible. We would have to, if, again, Milky Way is so large that if, if viewed from this distance, it would appear almost motionless. It would take 100,000 years before we can even see this shape start to appear. A whole human life spent, a lifetime would pass with no apparent change in the Milky Way. However, galaxies like ours are not stationary. It is a spiraling galaxy. It is estimated that our solar system orbits the galaxy center at near 500,000 miles per hour. Again, our solar system is traveling around the galaxy at an average speed of 500,000 miles per hour with the sun dragging the planets in tow. This uh, is a model of the solar system now referred to as the helical model of the solar system, which better describes this motion. Did you know you were traveling at 500,000 miles per hour? And your, your hair isn't even blowing. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> well, galaxies are massive structures, many with hundreds of billions of stars. One galaxy, I'll circle it for you right there and zoom in on it. One galaxy can actually be seen with the naked eye if you know exactly where to look. It, it was originally thought to be a nebula until Edwin Hubble dis, uh, established that it was actually a galaxy. Looks like a, a fuzzy star to the naked eye. This is the Andromeda galaxy. It's the nearest large spiral galaxy to our own. It's only 2.5 million light years away, so it'll only take you 2.5 million years traveling at 186,000 miles per second to reach it, if you wanted to tour it. It is more than double the size of the Milky Way, more than 220,000 light years in size, and contains an estimated one trillion stars. This is one of the highest resolution images uh, taken of Andromeda, released by NASA a few years ago, to illustrate the immensity of the stars found in Andromeda. As we zoom further and further and further and further into Andromeda, you just see more and more and more stars. And remember, our Heavenly Father calls them each by name. The Whirlpool Galaxy can be seen here. Just uh, showing you a few more galaxies. Our galaxy is believed to look like the Whirlpool Galaxy. This one's at 60, a small, rather small, 60,000 light years um, across and believed to be about 30 million light years away. Here's a Sombrero Galaxy. At these uh, distances, when you get out to these kind of distances, these are at 300 million light years away you can actually obtain a, a, an image with more than one galaxy in the same field of view. This is the same famous Stevens Quintet, five galaxies in the same field of view, taken at 300 million light years away. An even more remarkable photo was obtained when NASA aimed the Hubble Space Telescope at a region of space that was believed to contain no astronomical objects. An area as small as a grain of sand held at arm's length that contained no objects. They put the Hubble Space Telescope there and left it there for two weeks. And after two weeks of exposure, they, they obtained this image. An area of space believed to contain no astronomical objects was found to be full of galaxies. Everything in this image is a galaxy. And it was estimated that there were 10,000 galaxies in this image. Based on that number, if extrapolated over the entirety of the night sky, they calculated that there must be at least 100 billion galaxies in the universe, each with an estimated 100 billion stars. NASA released this new map of the galaxies. A striking outcome of this mapping project revealed that the galaxies are not randomly and evenly distributed in the universe. The absence of homogeneity in their distribution lies in stark contrast to the expectations of the Big Bang Theory. Many galaxies are clearly gravitationally bound to form clusters, which are loosely bound to form superclusters, which, which in turn seem to be aligning on some larger scale structures referred to as the cosmic web. Our universe is estimated to be at least 150 billion light years across. 
again, containing an estimated 100 billion galaxies and an estimated 100 billion stars each. And then again, can consider that our God counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. We might ask again, why did God create such vast co- vastness within the cosmos? Well, the Bible gives us the answer to declare his glory, declare his righteousness, and to give us a hint, just a hint of who our God really is. The universe is vast beyond comprehension. The visible universe contains more than 100 billion galaxies. Each of these galaxies has a diameter millions of trillions of miles wide, and each contains hundreds of billions of stars. Though incomprehensible, it is now estimated that the universe holds over a billion trillion stars. Long before the introduction of the telescope, scripture declared that man would be unable to determine the exact number because there are so many. Of course, the Creator knows the exact number, and Psalm 147 declares that He even calls each star by name. The power to create each of these stars, the wisdom to maintain their stellar courses, and the incredible beauty displayed throughout the universe combine to affirm the Creator's majesty and care. God has made the universe so vast. All man can do is just marvel at this universe, the vastness of it. And I say, God, you are so, you are so great. And I think of what David said, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have made, what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that you should visit him? Well, it's estimated that there are over 100 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it's estimated that there are over 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Which the Bible tells us that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways above our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts. So chew on that for a little bit. Think about how big the universe is compared to the earth, which is just uh, the head of a pin by comparison. Just how big is God's universe? Traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, we could circle the Earth seven times in one second. However, to travel across the known universe at the speed of light would take 28 billion years or more. Today, most astronomers acknowledge that the universe appears to be expanding. This also agrees with the Bible, which says God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. There are some examples in the Bible of scientific foresight. One example that comes to mind in particular is in Isaiah 40, 22, which talks about God stretching out the heavens as a tent or as a curtain. And you might say, well, that, you know, that is written in a poetic way, so we gotta be careful. And yet there are at least 10 other places in the Bible where it talks about this, this stretching out of the heavens. And that's something that uh, was only discovered in the uh, 20th century when we found that indeed all the galaxies appear to be, or virtually all of them appear to be moving away from each other as if the entire universe is being, lo and behold, stretched out and expanded, just like the Bible says. And that's obviously not something that that people could have observed in ancient times. That's something that had to have been revealed to them from above. Unimaginably large, containing spectacular galaxies and stunning nebulae, truly, the heavens declare the glory of God. Well, now let's consider how small the Earth really is in comparison. In 1997, NASA launched the Voyager 1 spacecraft on a mission to explore the gas giants, Saturn and Jupiter, and subsequently went on to the outer planets. 13 years after its launch in 1990, when it was 4 billion miles away, they turned the spacecraft around and took a picture in the direction of the Earth. This picture. And if you look really, really close, you can see a faint blue dot right there. That is the Earth. Well, the person responsible for NASA turning around the Voyager 1 to take this picture was none other than Carl Sagan. 
As an outspoken critic of persons of faith, I think he did it to make the point that the earth is insignificant. In his book, The Pale Blue Dot, he said this, Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. In his book, Cosmos, he said, For as long as there have been humans, we have searched for our place in the cosmos. Where are we? Who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of the universe in which there are far more galaxies than people. But the truth is, our knowledge of the cosmos says the exact opposite. The world is so perfect and beautiful that it seems almost magical. A world like ours simply should not exist within the great enveloping cosmic dark, as Carl Sagan called it. In a universe of cold, empty darkness, a world exists that is perfectly positioned, perfectly equipped with just the right amounts of everything we need. God has made the world full of abundant evidence that it was created. So why can't these natural scientists see the truth? Remember Francis Crick said he has to constantly keep in mind that what we see was not designed but rather evolved. Romans 1, 20, 21 gives us some insight for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. And then he continues. For even though they knew God, they knew there was a creator, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools." Well, that is the nature of science today, shackled as it is by the teachings of naturalism. They can see the truth, but refuse to acknowledge the witness of their own eyes. See, everyone knows that God exists and has made the world. Psalms 9.16 says the Lord has made himself known. Psalms 14.1 says the fool says in his heart there is no God. People know, but are willfully blinding themselves to the worldview of naturalism and evolution because it's an easier way to live. Living a life of righteousness before God is hard, requiring serious dedication and commitment. It's easier to live as the world lives, but living that way, you would live in constant fear if you understood that you would stand before God one day in judgment. The writer of Hebrews says, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the Almighty God. To not live in this fear, they have gathered around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear, that there is no God. They have turned their ears away from the truth and turned aside to myths, the myth of evolution, as uh, Paul said in 2 Timothy 4. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear from what he has made that God loves us and wanted to provide us not just a habitat, a perfect habitat, but also a home that is beautiful and wonderful. And then he watches over us daily. Psalms 33, from heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind from his dwelling place. He watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. He doesn't just watch you. He considers everything you do. Then consider that God who did all this loves us so much that he sent his only son to die so that our sins could be forgiven and we could have a relationship with him. And in doing so, defined what it really means to love. This is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Amazing love, truly. How can it be?